is here today to talk to us about the efficient relative binding for energy calculations using Lambda Dynamics. Can you see my screen, Kira? Uh, I'm getting there. Yes, we can. And we can also see you. OK, great. So thanks very much, Kira, for that introduction. And um, thanks to the organizers for this great conference. I'm really excited to present here. So my talk today is about the Lambda Dynamics method as recently implemented in um, the commercial packages by Via Discovery Studio and Pipeline Pilot. And the problem that we are trying to assist in is structure-based lead optimization, where the target, um, you know, 3D structure of the protein interacting with the lead compound is a given. Then the task at hand for a computational or a medicinal chemist is to ideate around this compound um, to, in an attempt to improve the activity of the compound, but also in concert, a whole host of other properties, other drug-like properties. And in this exercise, it is very useful to have uh, an accurate and efficient tool to predict uh, activities because the experimental synthesis and assaying of uh, design ideas is extremely um, you know, expensive and time consuming. And since the activity of the compound is uh, closely related to its biophysical binding affinity, we can apply physics-based methods to, to calculate that. And especially in the context of structure-based lead optimization, not only um, is the binding site known, but since you're making small tweaks to the lead compound in a vast majority of cases, the overall binding mode does not change. So we can take advantage of this fact and apply relative free energy methods to address this problem. So one problem with, you know, we, in the previous talk, we talked about the um, computing costs of the absolute free energy methods, but even relative free energy methods, explicit solvent relative free energy methods are uh, time consuming. And so typically what you see in projects is the application of uh, docking scoring or MMG based type methods in earlier stages to go through a large number of compounds, narrow them down to a small set, which are amenable to these relative uh, free energy calculations. And especially we have seen the application of uh, relative FEP by a large number of groups in the past five years. And um, you know we've seen that if these calculations are using an accurate enough force field and are set up carefully, can be quite uh, accurate. But at a computing cost of about you know one to two compounds per GPU per day, it still is uh, you know limiting the application to a small slice of chemical space. So I believe there's a strong need for methods to fill this middle range in this funnel to provide accurate screening like FEP does, but with a higher degree of efficiency. And so that's what my focus is going to be here with the Lambda Dynamics method which um, is physically rigorous like FEP because it's based on the tenets of statistical mechanics, but can allow for you know, incorporation of large combinatorial libraries in a single calculation. And that's how it, it gains efficiency. So the method itself uh, was first uh, um, you know, ideated by Charlie Brooks in, back in 1996, a long time ago. But since then the method has gone you know, significant improvements and I think it is at a stage right now, which is, um, you know, allows it to apply this method in industrial projects. So let's look at, um, you know, compare and contrast it with FEP to, uh, let, me, let me use that mechanism to explain how this works. So in FEP, we implement a chemical um, modification between two ligands by simulating a series of lambda windows. And we calculate the free energy difference in each lambda window by using, for example, the thermodynamic perturbation formula or BAR. And we sum all of those windows to get the free energy difference. In lambda dynamics, we don't have um, distinct lambda windows. Lambda is a continuous variable, which is coupled to the system dynamics via an extended Lagrangian. And this way it is propagated like um, the coordinates of uh, you know, the atoms in the system. So it, uh, the system follows the intrinsic free energy landscape of this alchemical transformation. And what you do is at the end of the simulation, you calculate the probabilities of the end states and the ratio of those probabilities gives you the free energy difference. So you're calculating the same quantity that you do in FEP, but through a different route. And what this design enables is to not merely have just a couple of ligands in a calculation, but you can have multiple ligands. So for example, this is a time series of the lambda as a function of um, uh, simulation time. And in this simulation, there are four different uh, ligands. Each ligand has its own lambda value fluctuating between zero and one. And we have constraints in place that ensure that the system, um, so 
that the lambda values are always between zero and one, and the system remains physical because um, because of this uh, constraint uh, where the sum of all the lambda values is is one. So at any given given point of time, you can have only one ligand that is fully interacting with the protein. So um, what you have in a sense here is a competitive binding assay where the ligands are competing with each other to to bind to the protein. And uh, what makes it even more useful here is that if you implement that competition, not at just one site in the ligand, but at multiple sites. So um, this way we are able to model combinatorial libraries where we are able to screen simultaneously different modifications to a ligand at different sites. And this is what we call multi-site lambda dynamics. And so here's a you know, typical example that shows you the scalability that this approach affords you. So we have a core a molecule you can think of as a lead compound, and you want to modify this at three different positions. And um, let's say we want to screen five different modifications at each site. And these can be the same, or it can be different for each site. And it can be you know, more complicated than what I've shown here. Here I'm showing you um, our group um, that is replacing a hydrogen atom with one of these groups but it can be, for example, sampling different kinds of aromatic rings here and here. But in any case, if we sample five different modifications at each site, that leads to 125 different combinatorial ligands. And if you want to tackle this problem using FEP, you'll have to create a relative FEP map like this, which should have um, at least 124 different delta delta G calculations in a minimal setting. But, um, if you include cycle closures, that would be about 180 different calculations. And so what you do in relative FEP using the map approach is that you pre-decide this alchemical route that your system takes from one ligand to all the other ligands. But in lambda dynamics, in multi-site lambda dynamics, you have the entire alchemical system being modeled in a single, um, you know, single calculation. So in principle, you can have an all-to-all -all transition. And so the system on its own finds the optimal paths to traverse this landscape. So that's, that brings uh, one layer of efficiency. And as I mentioned, you don't uh, need, so that brings um, a second layer of efficiency to these calculations. Now, one problem with this approach is that um, there may exist free energy barriers in the uh, alchemical lambda space. So when you have that, then you'll have you know, few exchanges taking place and therefore poor estimates of free energies. So what we do here to uh, alleviate this problem is that we modulate this landscape uh, by adding biasing functions that serve to flatten out the free energy landscape. So one of the biasing functions is this uh, so-called fixed bias, which aims, which uh, you know, serves to flatten out the, or even out the free, energy, um, free energies of the end states. There's another biasing function that is quadratic in nature, and that flattens out this hump in the mid range of lambda values. And there are two additional biasing functions which are associated with the creation and inhalation of cavities in the end states. And so taken together, all of these functions flatten out the free energy landscape of, um, uh, and as a function of lambda substantially. And when you do production simulations on these uh, flattened landscapes, you get a large number of healthy exchanges that are conducive to getting free energy estimates in a reasonable amount of time. We still leave out about you know, three to four kcal per mole barrier uh, in the middle range because we want to bias the sampling more towards the uh, physical end states rather than spending a lot of time in the you know, unreal intermediate states. So this is like a balancing act where we want to um, you know, sample the end states, but at the same time, we want to escape these and go to other um, you know, sampling the other ligands. So the challenge, you know, a main challenge here is that these biasing functions are not uh, transferable between different systems and you have to tailor, tailor make them for, you know, any system that you, um, that you're working on new. So um, there was this uh, algorithm called automated landscape flattening, which was published by Ryan Hayes and others at Charlie Brooks's group, where they um, developed an algorithm in which you iteratively run a series of lambda dynamic simulations. And through those iterations, you learn the landscape and adjust these uh, constants that you see in these functions. So we maintain the functional form 
but we um, you know, learn these uh, constants and these functions. And that way we're able to flatten out the landscape for any system um, you know, without the user having to mess around with any of these uh, constants here. And we have tested it on a wide range of systems and it, it really works quite reliably. So this is what we implemented in our workflow. So um, this, this, you know, the set of tasks involved in setting up and executing a Lambda Dynamics calculations can be quite cumbersome and error prone if you do it manually. So we developed a workflow in Discovery Studio and Pipeline Pilot, which we called MSLD workflow. And it begins with the first step, which is generating the binding poses of the compounds that you want to screen. Because um, ideally you want to start with the right binding pose. Um, uh, if you, um, you know, even though the simulations involve molecular dynamics, uh, you, you would sort of have the odds uh, in, in favor of you if you start from the right pose. So we um, use a template based method to uh, generate the initial binding poses. And we showed last year in this validation that you know, using a template based approach is much more reliable than a docking based approach, especially when you're talking about closely related um, analogous compounds. So once you have that, then the workflow will automatically assign um, force field parameters consistent with this charm general force field to the ligand and charm uh, protein force field to the protein. And then uh, it will uh, create a multi topology system uh, given all the input ligands and their assigned force field parameters. So those of you familiar with FEP would know a dual topology system. So this is just uh, sort of taking that to the next step where we have um, you know, tens or hundreds of ligands all uh, modeled in a single uh, multi-topology entity. And then we embed this into the protein and solvate that. And we also generate a you know, free ligand solvated system. We, we need both of these because you want to close the thermodynamic cycle. And then the workflow proceeds into the iterative bias optimization, which I mentioned in the previous slide. So we run short, um, short simulations, um, 100 picoseconds to one nanoseconds. And then uh, through those iterations, we uh, learn the landscape and optimize these biasing functions. And once the biases are optimized, we, uh, the protocol um, goes into MSLD production. And so we run these production simulations about you know, cumulative, cumulatively speaking about 120 nanoseconds spread over three different trajectories. And uh, we calculate those probabilities of the individual ligands involved. And then we subtract the biases because we want to retrieve the true free energy values free of those biases. And that gives us the um, uh, you know, relative free energies of the entire combinatorial library. So the workflow is implemented in uh, Pipeline Pilot, BioVia Pipeline Pilot, but the workhorse, that is the simulation engine um, underlying these calculations is CHAM running on the DOMDEC GPU platform. So uh, to validate this workflow, we collected a data set from prior FEP studies. And so our data set uh, comprises of 165 ligands spread over seven different proteins. And um, the dynamic range of each of these data sets is close to 4K cal per mole. So it's representative of a typical uh, lead optimization scenario. And we had to you know, uh, get these data sets from different sources because um, the MSLD domain of applicability is subtly slightly different from FEP. In FEP, you can have your congenetic data set where you can have changes all over the molecule. But the ideal domain of applicability for MSLD is, you know, um, directed chemical space search at distinct sites on the molecule. So uh, from these data sets, we want to ask, um, you know, three basic questions. That is, how big can our substituents be in these calculations? How much sampling do we need to get converged and accurate free energy values? And how many ligands can we basically jam in a single calculation? So what is the scalability of this approach? So to answer the first two questions, we created subsets like these small subsets, um, which involved between um, six to 32 ligands. So I'm showing you the small uh, subsets, uh, three examples here to give you a picture of the kind of modifications that are included here. So some of our subsets were, you know, involved um, simple modifications, like you have uh, the decorations around this terminal phenyl, phenyl ring in this molecule. And some subsets were um, modeling 
topologically and chemically more diverse changes. For example, here you have different kinds of uh, aromatic rings being sampled at the end of this molecule. And then there were some which were which involved very diverse side chains. So here, for example, we have up to 10 heavy atoms changing um, while the sampling of uh, this molecule happens. So overall, we had 25 different subsets and four to six heavy atom differences were fairly common in these, uh, in these systems. And across the board, we see that using 150 nanoseconds of cumulative sampling time, which includes 30 nanoseconds for bias optimization and 120 nanoseconds divided between three trajectories um, to be sufficient to obtain um, accurate results. So here I'm showing you um, a snap up sort of composite view of the results divided between the seven different proteins. And on the bottom right, you have the average ensign errors and all of them are you know, well under one kcal per mole. And the average precision that we see from these calculations and uh, the precision, uh, precisions are calculated by you know, averaging three independent trajectories is um, 0.5 kcal per mole. And so we see that about 70% of our predictions are under one kcal per mole error and about 90% under 1.5 kcal per mole. So at least in this retrospective data set, we see that these predictions are accurate and precise enough to be used for um, prioritizing compounds for synthesis. Uh, we have a lot more metrics reported in this preprint that went live uh, more than a month ago, and it's now accepted in JCTC. So you can find all the raw data and other metrics. Um, it's all out there if you want to take a look at it. So those predictions were um, obtained by, you know, dividing those data sets into subsets, small subsets, which I call small scale screening. And the size of those subsets were between six to 32 um, ligands. But do we maintain the accuracy and precision when we're doing a large scale screening? So we collected five such systems. And uh, to be honest, this was not easy to find this sort of data set which has uh, you know, dense experimental data for all combinations. Uh, but I'm showing you a representative data set here. So um, this is a ligand from the P38 mypecanase uh, protein, and you have three different sites of modification. On the site one, there are you know, fairly modest changes with uh, just the location of this, um, this fluorine on this phenyl ring, but site two and site three model more um, chemically and topologically diverse um, diverse uh, side chains. So with our default 150 nanoseconds of sampling, we are able to, um, you know, sorry, we're able to estimate the free energies of the entire combinator library, 125 ligands. I think we missed three ligands, but we almost sample, um, so we almost sample all of them. And the red uh, bars that you see here are the uh, combinations for which experimental data is available. And uh, we are able to, you know, predict the experimental trends in affinity uh, within this uh, subset pretty well. So if you were to do this calculation using a standard FEP approach, and I'm making some um, sort of ballpark assumptions here uh, based on recent contemporary FEP studies, where you use about 60 nanoseconds of cumulative sampling per ligand and accounting for some, uh, some degree of uh, redundancy in the form of cycle closures, you would take about 11 microseconds of sampling to, to screen through this data set. And Lambda Dynamics is substantially more efficient with, uh, with 150 nanoseconds of sampling. So uh, let me summarize the main points here. Um, so we developed an automated workflow and end-to-end -end workflow, which begins with uh, generating the binding poses of the, of the ligands, all the way to running the calculations and obtaining the binding free energies. The approach um, is, seems to be substantially more efficient if we compare to the amount of sampling that is undertaken in um, you know, contemporary FEB studies. We used uh, about five-fold less sampling when we were calculating systems that involved a single site. But if you look at um, combinatorial libraries involving two or three sites, this efficiency gain um, ranges from 10 to 75-fold. One limitation to mention here is that um, 
we limit the number of ligands that we can model at a single site to nine or less, because um, when you include 10 or more ligands at a single site, we see the number of exchanges to go down um, drastically low. And so we get poor statistics there. But so if you want to, um, um, you know, a common use case in the industry is to screen through, let's say 50 modifications at a single site. So if you want to do a screening like that, the way to go would be to divide those 50 ligands into small MSLA systems. And there are automated ways to do this in a very straightforward way. And I must also mention that uh, we redid some of these calculations using a um, lesser amount of sampling. And we see that for the small scale screening, that is ligands involving six to 32 ligands, if you half the production sampling from 120 nanosecond to 60 nanoseconds, we don't notice a significant drop in accuracy. So the numbers that you're seeing here is uh, probably a conservative estimate for single site screening. It is likely um, going to be uh, a tenfold gain in efficiency compared to uh, standard FEP. So given all this, we, uh, it is our hope that this approach can begin to fill this gap in the middle range of this funnel by you know, allowing access to accurate screening to a larger slice of the chemical space um, because of the efficiency afforded by MSLD. So uh, let me close here by thanking our collaborators. We collaborated closely with Charlie Brooks's group, Ryan and TJ. And um, so you can, um, I didn't have a chance to go into a lot of nuances of this work. And I encourage you to take a look at the preprint uh, chem archive paper, which should be hopefully in JCT scene um, in, in a couple of weeks. Um, I also want to thank former group members of Charlie Brooks's group who also advised us during the development of this tool uh, and the science. And um, also thank the R&D team at Biovia and the product team who also helps, helped us uh, advise um, during the development of this uh, product. So thank you for your attention and I can take questions. Thanks Prabhu, uh, this is a great talk. Uh, so I'm gonna start with uh, one question from our panelists because I know it'll be a quick answer just because I know I already know the answer. But okay. um, from Hannah, she asked, what happens to the samples at the intermediate lambda values? Do they contribute to the free energy estimates, estimates or is it only the end states? Uh, it's only the end states, yeah. We don't, um, we basically demarcate the end states as uh, the lambda values um, over 0.99 and we don't use the intermediate states. Okay. Uh, from Rohit Aurora, can you please expand on how the FEP map is replaced by a single path in lambda dynamics? Right. So, um, you know, in the FEP approach, you need a map because you uh, each calculation involves two ligands. And what you do is then you plan a large number of these calculations and you stitch them together to um, walk the graph, you know, to go from your lead compound for which the affinity is known to all the other ligands in your data set. But in, in lambda dynamics, uh, what you have in a sense is a maximally connected graph. That is you have, since the, all the ligands are included in a single calculation, you don't need to you know, work with uh, pairwise calculations. And so that's how it's all collapsed in a, in a, in a single uh, calculation. I hope that okay. answers this. Okay. Up next is from uh, Aniket Margarkar. Uh, can this method be applied to ligands with different formal charges? No, we have not. Um, so um, we haven't tried it yet. So our data set, uh, we purposely chose molecules which were, you know, um, have the same charge state. But um, in, in FEP, you apply endpoint corrections to account for the, you know, finite size effects and, and, and the charge changes. So I don't see why we cannot do it in MSLE. It's just that we haven't included that in our, um, so far we, the tool doesn't support it, but it can be done. Okay, uh, from John Codera, fantastic work. Recently, the, the Brooks lab noted that Lambda Dynamics could introduce significant bias in predicting binding free energies dependent on the Lambda threshold. Have you been able to identify ways to eliminate that bias? So, um, so there was a time where uh, in the Brooks lab, they were using lambda cutoffs of 0 0.8 and uh, 0 0.9. And I think now it's, um, now the cutoff that we're using is 0 0.99, which is really close to one. 
And uh, that combined with the fact that you have, um, you know, we're using this automated landscape flattening where there's a great degree of, uh, you know, flattening happening in the landscape. So between 0.99 and one, um, it seems like there won't be, you know, a huge amount of curvature in the free energy landscape present to um, amount to, to sort of add to that bias. And plus we have done some, um, you know, benchmarking studies against FEP and the results that we get uh, with Atlanta Dynamics and FEP both for hydrogen free energies and binding free energies are, they match very close with an error. So I don't believe there is a huge amount of bias coming from that factor. Okay. All right, another one from our, one of our panelists, um, our speaker earlier today, Heather Carlson. The other, sorry, the error in the relative energies look good, but the relative rankings look a little problematic. Did you calculate the Spearman's row or Spearman's rows? Yeah, was, we calculated, I think, Kendall Tau, and that is reported in the paper. Uh, I don't remember offhand, but um, yeah, it, it's all there in the paper. Okay, uh, from Niels Hansen. Did you see issues with the slow diffusion between end states on the flattened energy landscape? Slow diffusion between end states. Um, actually, we haven't uh, looked at residence times. So I don't think I can answer that just as yet. Okay. Uh, from Somaz Azimi, how do you evaluate the convergence in large scale screenings? Right. So um, we run three replicates basically we run three trajectories and we calculate a simple standard deviation from the free energies that that come out of that and so you know your convergence would be reflected in the error bars that, that we report and as i said the you know the precision is about 0.5 k cal per mole and so i think that's um yeah so, this, so that's how basically we, we evaluate convergence okay um, you have a few more left uh, from Miroslav um, Shirozhin. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Do you have any data on how MSLD correlates against regular FEP when the same force field is used? We have done some calculations uh, with you know, hydrogen free energies, as I was just mentioning, and uh, a couple of protein systems. And it, it, it is, uh, as I said, it is with an error. And I think more, more of these calculations have been done by Charlie Brooks's group in a lot of pa papers before, which essentially show that uh, the method itself is, uh, it's, it's capturing the same physics. So yeah, I mean, I think the, the data that we have seen so far suggests that you should get the same answer. Okay, uh, from Rajat Kumar Paul, probably I missed this during the talk, but do you need any free energy estimators to calculate free energies by the MSLD approach? Yeah, we are just using a you know probability-based estimator. It's not um, you know uh, Zwanzig's formula or the Bennett acceptance ratio. Uh, so it's it's a very simple probability-based estimator. Okay, from Zhaoling Crockcroft, Croc, or Cockcroft, with the multiple sites workflow, can FEP generate the satisfactory perturbation maps? Sorry, uh, can you repeat that question? Sure. With the multiple sites workflow. Can FEP generate the satisfactory perturbation maps? Um, so, it, I didn't basically cover FEP in, in this talk. I was just trying to use that as a, you know, uh, a reference to explain the differences. So, I, I would assume that you know, if you give the same set of same combinator library to an FEP map approach, it would generate, um, you know, a map and let you do the calculations. Yes, I can tell you that my instance of using the uh, FEP map tool that you guys have built in Discovery Studio does give pretty satisfactory perturbation maps. You might need to add a few edges, but um, yeah, so I agree with you. Right, assessment. yeah, yeah, we have a minimal yeah. network. We don't have cycle closures yet, but yeah. Right, yep. Okay, and then the last question um, from an anonymous attendee, when do you reckon that Lambda Dynamics will be available in BioVia's Discovery Studio? So we released a prototype version of this technology about a year ago. And the latest developments that I talked about are hopefully should be out very soon. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank our speakers this afternoon, uh, both Jay and, Pon or, and Prabhu for giving such a great talk, great talks. Um, and I also want to close out today by stating that um, we will start again tomorrow at 1130. Our first talk uh, will be at 1145 from Christina Schindler.
and you can see our uh, schedule on the Alchemistry website. But other than that, thank you all for attending today's uh, instance of this event, and we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow. Have a great rest of your day. And probably you have another comment from John in the Q and A. Yeah, I just saw it. I okay. Get it. Yeah. Thanks, John. I'll I'll take a look and follow up. Yeah, they're great talks today. Thank you, everyone. It was really really good. Thanks, Anna. <laughs>、All、right, Prabhu, if you wanna. Sign off. You're welcome to. I'm gonna stay on with、uh, to make sure everybody gets off. Okay. Thanks, Kira. It was good to see you. Great to see you too. Uh, I think there's a risk that I will be slightly late tomorrow. But the first talk.、Uh, yeah. The first talk isn't being recorded. Oh, I'll stop.